In this module, we are going to talk about uh, how we get magnetic and azimuthal quantum numbers uh, in hydrogen atom. And uh, this is uh, by and large going to be a revision of uh, what we had said a couple of modules ago uh, when we talked about uh, rigid rotor because uh, this magnetic and azimuthal quantum numbers come from a, an exactly uh, similar uh, treatment uh, as we had done in case of rigid rotors. So, to recapitulate, uh, this is what we have done so far. We have said that this hydrogen atom, uh, Schrodinger equation for hydrogen atom uh, is written in a relative frame of reference. So, we start with this central force problem. You can write the Hamiltonian in terms of uh, nucleus and electron and then by making these substitutions x equal to xc minus xn y equal to ye minus xn and so on and so forth and capital X equal to mass weighted coordinates, we can separate the uh, equation into two, one for the motion of the center of mass and one for the motion of electron with respect uh, to the nucleus. And uh, as we had said, uh, when we do that, uh, this is what we get. The first kinetic energy term minus h cross square divided by 2 capital M. 2 capital M means, well capital M means the uh, mass of the atom as a whole, the total mass and this is del R square, this R is capital R which means this is the uh, position vector of the center of mass. And then uh, the second and third terms are in relative coordinates, the second term is for kinetic energy due to the motion of electron with respect to the nucleus. I am saying this again and again because it is important to understand this. It is not just motion of electron in free space, it is how much it moves with respect to the nucleus, how much does separation change in what kind of time, right? Uh, that is what we are talking about. Remember xc is equal to, uh, well x is equal to xc minus xn, y is equal to ye minus yn, z equal to ze minus zn. So, uh, this is a relative frame that we are talking about and the last term is minus qz square by r, this is a potential energy term for uh, interaction between uh, electron and nucleus. Of course, this r itself is uh, the separation between the nucleus and the electron. So, uh, the Hamiltonian separates into hn and he and as we see, uh, we can write the uh, total wave function as a product of a nuclear part and the uh, electronic part. Energy we can write as uh, a sum of a nuclear part and the well not really nuclear part, we can write uh, energy for movement of center of mass and energy of the electron with respect to the nucleus. So, what happens is that we can collect all the terms in the uh, center of mass coordinate and write a Schrodinger equation which is exactly the same as what we got earlier for free particle and that gives us the kinetic energy of the atom as a whole, the entire hydrogen atom moving in space. Of course, here the consideration is that the atom does not interact with anything else, that is why there is no potential energy term. And energy here is h cross k score, k, h cross square k square divided by 2 capital M which is not quantized. It can take up any possible value of energy. And what we are concerned about for the rest of the course is this one minus h cross square by 2 mu, mu remember is a relative, uh, is the reduced mass which is always used to uh, reduce a two body problem into a one body problem. So, minus h cross square by 2 mu del small r square kinetic energy of electron uh, for movement with respect to nucleus minus q z square by r potential energy is equal to uh, you can see uh, we have e e energy of the uh, electron multiplied by psi e that is the electronic part of the uh, Schrodinger equation that we deal with. This is where we had arrived and then we realize that there is a problem. 
So, this del r square is not a problem because you can write it as del 2 del x 2 plus del 2 del y 2 plus del 2 del z 2. The problem lies with this uh, small r in the denominator because it is square root of x square plus y square plus z square. How are we going to separate this? So, if we persist with uh, the Cartesian coordinates then we really cannot proceed further. We cannot uh, separate this equation into uh, smaller equations so we cannot solve it. So, we chose a different coordinate system this spherical polar coordinate and the ad biggest advantage here is that this r equal to square root of x square plus y square plus z square which posed the problem in uh, our trying to formulate it in uh, terms of Cartesian coordinates that r itself is a coordinate. So, uh, there is no issue as such and we have already gone through all these issues uh, all these uh, relationships earlier and uh, this is the uh, volume element that we are going to come back to uh, maybe a couple of modules later. Right. So, with that this is where we had stopped. We had been able to separate the variables, we had been able to separate the equations into 2, 1 in uh, terms of the radius r only we call that the radial equation and the other one is in terms of theta and phi we call it the angular equation. Uh, please remember that for spherical polar coordinates there are two classes of coordinates one is r which is a length and theta and phi together are angular coordinates they are angles. Now, uh, I am not going through the detail of separation of this angular equation into the phi part and theta part once again because we have done it while discussing rigid rotor already. So, I just uh, request you to recall uh, what we had talked about there uh, the theta part is sin theta by capital theta where capital theta is the theta dependent part of the wave function del del theta of sin theta del capital theta del theta and again let me uh, say that this del is not really required anymore might as well write uh, d because there is nothing other than theta in this entire equation. So, d d theta of sin theta d capital theta d theta plus beta sin square theta is equal to m square. So, this is the theta dependent part only theta terms are there nothing else and the phi dependent part is very very simple 1 by capital phi d 2 capital phi d phi 2 is equal to minus m square. Thus, the three variables r theta and phi are separated from each other. Now, uh, you might notice that we have written instead of capital M we have written a small m here that is a convention because uh, when we uh, talk about rigid rotor and when we talk about hydrogen atom we want to use a little bit of different convention for the two. So, that uh, right from what we write uh, it is uh, quite clear what we are talking about. So, uh, it is just a matter of convention that we are going to write uh, small m instead of capital M when we talk about hydrogen atom. Now, small m in terms of hydrogen atom should ring a bell. We all know what small m is in terms of hydrogen atom and I am not talking about mass here. Remember the quantum numbers n l m s m is that m it is really the magnetic quantum number, but we will arrive at it shortly. Okay. Uh, what I just told you was really a spoiler I told you what is going to come okay. and the way we will proceed is that we will once again go through the solution of the phi part only we are not going to explicitly solve the theta dependent part and the r dependent part because that is too much of mathematics and uh, we do not want to uh, this is really a chemistry course we do not want this to become a maths course. We will tell you the solutions you do not have to remember the solutions except for the general form and then we will uh, try and plot them later on and see what they look like right. So, let us proceed. So, solution to the phi part is known to us we know that uh, the solution is a multiplied by uh, e to the power plus minus i m phi once again here we use small m and a uh, is worked out in uh, one of the tutorial problems assignment problems that turns out to be 1 by root over 2 pi. So, uh, and then once again we use the periodic boundary condition the wave function has to be single valued. So, you start from a particular value of phi go around a full circle come back to the same point the wave function must have the same value once again which means capital phi for phi is equal to capital phi for phi plus 2 pi ok. We will start from phi go around a full circle come back to the same point. As we have discussed 
while talking about bond interpretation this uh, wave functions have to be single valued in order to satisfy or in order to conform with the uh, bond interpretation. So, uh, that is why that is what gives rise to this periodic boundary condition. And then uh, what we discussed earlier is that that is what leads to quantization of m. m can only take up values of 0, plus minus 1, plus minus 2 and so on and so forth. Please go back and recall our discussion of rigid rotor that is where we have worked it out. The only thing is I noticed that whenever I talked about that at that time I kept on saying m goes from 0, 1, 2, 3, 4 up to infinity. Let us not forget minus 1, minus 2 up to minus infinity also. So, in principle it can go up to plus minus infinity. Shortly we will see that there is actually a limit as far as the small m in hydrogen atom is concerned. And also uh, similar to or exactly like capital M for rigid rotor small m here denotes the z component of angular momentum. If you make the angular momentum operator operate on capital phi then you get m h cross multiplied by capital phi and eigenvalue equation the eigenvalue is m h cross. So, that is the z component of angular momentum and m is called magnetic quantum number. Why? Because if you apply a magnetic field or even an electric field uh, across uh, along the z axis then all that matters all the, uh, the uh, quantity that determines the kind of interaction uh, with this magnetic field along z direction is the z component of the field right. You have some uh, magnetic moment of the uh, electron it can point this way or this way or whatever right. So, if it is like this then the z component is more if it is like this then z component is 0 if it is like this then z component is negative right. So, uh, it is the magnetic quantum number m that determines the interaction with uh, magnetic field and that is why this was discovered uh, in the experimental study of Zeeman effect. Remember uh, in Zeeman effect uh, it was observed that the number of lines in hydrogen ion spectrum splits uh, increases upon applying a magnetic field and it was explained by this kind of space quantization in the within the ambit of uh, Bohr Sommerfeld model the electron is uh, expected to go around in a circular or elliptic circle uh, so circular or elliptic orbit and correspondingly there has to be an angular momentum which is normal to the plane of rotation. Now, here in quantum mechanics uh, we should eliminate this circular path because as we have said many times we cannot talk about the trajectory that is not allowed because that would violate uncertainty principle. Interestingly, we can still talk about this blue arrow the angular momentum vector and we can talk about this uh, allowed orientations of the angular momentum vector. So, we come back to the same point where the allowed orientations are plus m to minus m through 0 that is there are 2 m plus so sorry uh, plus l to minus l we will come to that later on. Uh, so, uh, that is what gives us the allowed orientations or now we can say allowed values of theta. So, that is called space quantization only specific values of small theta can uh, be taken up by this angular momentum vector right. So, that is space quantization in terms of quantum mechanics ok. How many values of m we will come to that shortly ok. So, please remember that uh, now we should not draw these uh, circular or elliptic orbits anymore, but we still have to retain the angular momentum vectors ok and their allowed discrete orientations. So, uh, crux of the matter is that this uh, m is a quantum number that determines the z component of angular momentum and therefore uh, or in other words it determines the angle at which the angular momentum vector is oriented. See the angular moment length of the arrow is same for all right. What determines the length of the arrow or other uh, in other words the uh, magnitude of the angular momentum we will come to that shortly. What we are saying is that given a particular total angular momentum orientations it can take up in space are determined by the values of m ok. This m h cross will give us the uh, preferred not preferred allowed values of theta 
or allowed orientations of the angular momentum vector. Okay. So, solution of phi part gives magnetic quantum number as we said as we learned from rigid rotor m can take up values of 0 plus minus 1 plus minus 2 plus minus 3 plus minus 4 and so on and so forth. We call it the magnetic quantum number and now we talk about uh, the restriction it does not really go up to plus minus infinity. m is restricted by another quantum number which is called the orbital or azimuthal quantum number small l remember small l it came in uh, board treatment as well uh, subsidiary quantum number azimuthal quantum number. So, m is restricted by another quantum number such that magnitude of m is less than l. Why is that so? Because if you recall the two uh, equations that arose from the angular part one is 1 by capital phi d2 capital phi d phi 2 is equal to minus m square the other one was something in theta equal to m square. So, m square actually is the bridge between the equation in phi and equation in theta. When you solve the equation in phi you get the allowed va values of m. When you solve the equation in theta then you get the limit to the allowed values of m and that turns out to be mod m less than l. Unfortunately, solving it is beyond the scope of uh, what we want this course to be. So, uh, we are not going to do it in this course we will take it axiomatically for now and similarly the same thing is going to happen for L and principal quantum number n. Okay. Now, let us move on to the theta part. In the theta part this here is the equation and you know the solution already. The solution is what is called uh, associated legendary polynomial in cos theta. Okay. And this as you can see is associated with another quantum number L. You see this uh, uh, just now have a look at this uh, expressions for the associated legendary polynomials. Here you have L minus m factorial in the denominator you have L plus m factorial minus 1 is raised to the power m and the polynomial itself is a function of L as well as m. Okay. So, these conditions when you work this out when we get uh, when we apply boundary conditions to these wave functions we get the allowed values of L to be 0, 1, 2, 3 and so on and so forth. We also get uh, that uh, get the condition that there should have been a mod sign here mod m modulus of m absolute value of m has to be less than or equal to L that is something that we know already 2 L plus 1 values of m are there. So, going back to the picture we showed earlier uh, for m L equal to 2 m can take up values of 2, 1, 0, minus 1, minus 2 5 values 5 is 2 L plus 1 where L equal to 2. Okay. Right. That also uh, this part also leads us to a very important uh, phenomenon that beta is equal to L into L plus 1. What is beta you remember uh, this is beta and uh, as we will show later on this beta is there in the theta part as well as the r dependent part of the equation. So, beta is the bridge between the theta part and r part of the uh, of Schrodinger equation. So, here we get b in is equal to l into l plus 1 okay. and that has some profound application as we will see shortly. But before we go there let us just summarize this part the angular part is the same as what we got for rigid rotor we have a constant which is a function of l and m multiplied by a uh, legendary polynomial in cos theta this form of legendary polynomial depends on L as well as m that is multiplied by e to the power i m phi and L ranges from 0 1 2 3 in principle up to infinity. But again when we discuss the r dependent part in the next module uh, we will put a limit to the values allowed values of L there as well and m is 0 plus minus 1 plus minus 2 plus minus 3 mod m less than equal to L. We have said this several times uh, sorry for the repetition, but uh, I wanted to say this before going to the next step. All right. Now, here we have discussed angular momentum in detail earlier. So, this we know very well is the L square operator and now look at the angular equation. As we had said in uh, our discussion of rigid rotor as well you can go very easily 
from the Hamiltonian of angular equation to uh, the uh, L square operator simply by multiplying this h cross square. Okay. So, once we do that we can try and manipulate and get an eigenvalue equation in L square. Okay. So, this is what we will do. First of all we will uh, just multiply by capital theta capital phi. So, what will happen? This capital theta will uh, cancel and you get capital phi in the numerator. Here this capital phi will get uh, cancelled and you get capital theta in the numerator. Now, let us multiply by h cross square. So, on the left hand side what we have is minus h cross square capital phi by sin theta d well del capital theta del theta d is fine here until now sin theta del capital theta del theta plus capital theta by sin square uh, theta multiplied by del 2 capital phi del phi 2 that is equal to h square beta capital phi capital theta. Now, see I might as well write it like this. Uh, if you go back to the earlier one, uh, I can uh, there is no harm if I take this capital phi inside this uh, operator in theta because capital phi is constant with respect to theta anyway. Similarly, I can take this capital theta inside this capital phi. So, uh, this is what we will write and hence uh, of course, we have to multiply by sin square theta so that this goes there is no need actually. So, we get this uh, there is no need to do that actually. So, here let us see what we have on the left hand side minus h cross square 1 by sin theta del del theta operating on sin theta del del theta same thing as here plus 1 by sin square theta del 2 del phi 2 same thing as we have here. So, on the left hand side we have the L square operator operating on the spherical harmonics the theta phi dependent wave function of hyd uh, hydrogen atom. That gives us back the same wave function multiplied by h cross square multiplied by beta. What does that mean? That means that square of total angular momentum is h cross square beta and if you remember that beta is L into L plus 1 you might as well substitute that. So, we get that uh, we get the result that the square of total angular momentum is h cross square multiplied by L into L plus 1. So, uh, from there what we uh, might as well write is you can write something like this angular momentum I just write it so that we are not confused between the quantity and the operator angular momentum well it is better to write total angular momentum here that turns out to be root over L into L plus 1 multiplied by h cross right. A universal result that keeps back uh, to uh, will haunt us time and again. So, what we have understood then is that we can uh, figure out the total angular momentum from uh, the theta dependent part. So, remember we talked about the length of the arrow this here is the length of the arrow root over L into L plus 1 multiplied by h cross and what is the z component? z component is m h cross. So, if I uh, draw this let me just draw this picture once. Let us say this here is the z axis this dotted arrow this is your uh, angular momentum vector or maybe we will just make it a solid arrow it looks horrible. Well, this is not supposed to be so wavy it is just uh, that my hand is not very stable on the surface. So, what we get is uh, first of all this is theta this length turns out to be root over L into L plus 1 and I will write h cross in the beginning and if I drop a perpendicular here on z axis what is this length? This is m 
h cross. So, uh, what do we get from there? What is the relationship between m and l and theta? Very simple uh, trigonometry. So, uh, one can actually work out the orientation of the angular momentum vector if we know m and if we know l. Right? That is what once again takes back uh, takes us back to space quantization. Since only discrete values of m are allowed, discrete values of l are allowed, discrete values of theta are allowed and that in other words is space quantization. Right? And then just to remind you we can a very convenient way of drawing these angular distribution functions, angular parts of Schrodinger equation is by using polar plots. Okay. What I have written here is the total wave function of uh, psi 2 pz or psi where n equal to 2, l equal to 1 and uh, m equal to 0. Okay. So, uh, again it is a spoiler, but you get something like this. Uh, if you forget the radial part, you are left with the angular part cos theta. The uh, what about phi? What, where is the phi part? e to the power i m phi m is equal to 0. Remember 2 1 0 means m equal to 0. So, that phi part is essentially becomes 1. We will discuss later uh, what happens when the phi part is uh, non-zero. Well, when uh, phi, uh, well m is non-zero. So, the phi part is, uh, what am I saying? So, uh, we will see later on what happens when this phi part does not conveniently become 1 or a constant. Uh, we will see how to deal with that. But for now, uh, the only angular part that we need to concern ourselves with is cos theta. How do we plot cos theta? Uh, I will just do a quick recap of what we had discussed two or three modules earlier. This is a polar graph paper. Remember, the independent axis is the angle, dependent axis is the length. Here is a table with in increments of 10 degrees of theta and cos theta, that is a function we are interested in. Uh, for theta equal to 0 cos theta is 1. So, this length is 1 for theta equal to 90 degrees cos theta is obviously 0. So, this is 0 and from uh, theta equal to 0 to 90 degrees cos theta keeps increasing then it goes through a maximum and then it decreases to 0 sorry it keeps decreasing from 1 to 0. Uh, so, this is how the lengths of the arrows is going to decrease remember the length is what determines the uh, value of cos theta. So, you get this kind of a uh, curve. What happens when you go beyond 90 degrees? You start getting negative values. There is no way in which we can uh, show negative here. So, what we do is we use a different color and we write the sign of the uh, function cos theta explicitly in the relevant parts of the curves. And also please remember that theta ranges from 0 to 180 degrees. So, you should not draw anything beyond 180 degrees. So, this is a way of designating your uh, angular part of the wave function. Now, I would like you to think something, uh, look at this curve and think a little bit. See, this curve is valid for any value of phi, is not it? So, let us say I have a, so, so this plane that we have shown here is uh, the plane where you have uh, theta as one axis and function of theta cos theta in this case as the other. Let us now consider a perpendicular plane okay? and let us say this angle is phi. Okay? Does it matter what phi is? For all values of phi right from 0 to 2 pi uh, whatever is uh, the value of cos theta for a particular value of theta will remain the same. right? So, uh, we can think that if we just rotate it around by 360 degrees, what are we going to get? We are going to get something that looks like a dumbbell, is not it? right? For all values of phi, since it is phi independent, we will get same values. If there is a phi dependence, then there will be modulation, then it becomes a little more complicated. But since there is no phi dependence here, we will get two lobes, one uh, with uh, positive sign of cos theta, one with negative sign of cos theta. Does it remind you of something? Does not it look exactly like the p orbital that we are used to seeing in textbook? Two lobes plus on one 
and uh, minus on the other. Well, the pictures that you saw there were sort of constructed like this. Okay, but we'll have more to talk about uh, how to designate, how to uh, show orbital. Uh, well, how to show the wave functions uh, in uh, the subsequent modules. So now we are done with our discussion of the angular part. Next, we are going to discuss the radial part of the wave function.